<laughs> How would you describe your family? Extremely special. Very um, special. And very dedicated. I think those are the two words that I would use off the bat. Um, a team. Yeah, we, we really have to work at work on being a team and just being a unified force and just being dedicated to the kids. Tell me a little bit about why he wears that helmet. So, Emma wears a helmet because he has self injurious behavior. Um, yeah. So, when Emmett gets upset or scared or confused, he hits himself. And in order to protect himself, we have a helmet that we put on him to make sure that he doesn't injure himself. Um, along with the helmet, we have a guard as well to make sure that he doesn't get his face. And this allows him to, I guess, express himself enough to where he doesn't hurt himself. And also cope with negative situations. Yes. Um, if, he, if he gets pushed too far during a third position or um, encounters a situation he doesn't understand, there, there's time, it creates time and space for us to actually make sure he's safe. Over uh, on the other side of our house, we have a safe room for Emmett specifically because of his meltdowns and his self interest behavior. And that's another thing that we've learned is that sometimes when your kids are going through difficult times, you have to be able to give them a, an environment where that time becomes less difficult and that time becomes safer for them. Like Devin was saying, when he has a meltdown, we have to make sure he's safe. So we put his helmet on. Um, if needed, we'll put leg guards on and a torso guard on. And then we have a closet that's like a storage area that we also have a crash pad in with mats. And then we put mats over the closet part and we kind of let him have his moments. We'll do like blankets and pillows just so that he's able to work through the meltdown in a safe environment. What is it like to be the parents of two autistic boys who have high support needs? It's hard. That's what we put up. It's hard. Um, you know, there's been times where it has been hard on us individually, um, where it's been hard on us as a marriage. But I think at the same time, it's helped us appreciate life more. We're out here in your garage gym, where it's a little more quiet than inside. Is this one of the only places in the house where there is a little bit of quiet? Yeah, um, I, I, I work out out here. Um, I set up a little meditation corner and stuff too when I'm done working out, just to kind of give myself a little bit of zen sometimes. It's, it's a good spot. I like my garage. Why is that meditation necessary? Um, oh man, <laughs> so if you'd asked me that, that about a year ago, I wouldn't have had a good answer for you, but um, really, like I'm a huge advocate for mental health and meditation's good to quiet a lot of the anxieties that you can have as a special needs parent, especially for long-term problems. People who watch this may see your dad helping out yes. behind the scenes. <laughs> Thank you for being here. <laughs> Tell me about his role within the family. Um, my dad raised me by himself, so my dad and I have always been very close. But my dad also has background with working with special needs kids, so he was able to kind of help us understand that in a way. Tell me about Dominic. Dominic is our raptor, and we, we say that because um, he's... Always, well, one, he's always loved birds. He's either bird or raptor, depending on what kind of a mood he's in. But um, he, he's a very vocal and... Uh, he's free. He, yeah, he's free. And I, like, I, I don't know how to describe his robust personality. Like He's very, uh, very clear about what he wants and about how he's going to have life. And um, he has no problems with... He'll let you know. Yeah, he's no problem with communicating yeah. if, if you're falling short of those expectations. Why does Dominic wear headphones? So his, his hearing's really sensitive. Um, his hearing's really sensitive, and we're not sure if sometimes in between haircuts his hair might bother him and the headphones might tamp that down too. Um, but it can be a combination of both. What would he do if there's loud sounds? Um, he would cover his ears and start to kind of give us signs that it's bothering him. But if he's subjected to it for too long, he will go into a meltdown. 
he'll start to cry. He might start to crawl out his cheeks and his ears because it, he, like, he can't stop it and he can't control how it's making him feel and we're not helping him. So if he doesn't have access to those coping mechanisms, it, it can go from, you know, basic sort of like, hey, you guys need to get me headphones to more um, reactive aggression or even sometimes some self-interest behavior. Dominic, I gave him the nickname Birdie because when I look at Dominic, I just see somebody that is free within themselves. Do you have a lot of pride being their dad? 100% I do. I love my kids. I love my kids more than anything and it's, it's fun seeing them kind of go out to the world and just just be who they are. How old are they? They're eight, gonna be nine. What's it been like to see them grow up? It's been a gift. Emmett's <laughs> autism is hard because he has the self-interest behavior. You know, Dominic does have behaviors. He is more outward where he will attack people and that can be hard as well. Um, but for Emmett to see your child, and both of them struggle, but to see Emmett struggle so much and hurt himself is, is very hard. But Emmett has a love for life that I've never seen in another human being. And I truly am not sure if that's because he has autism, but I think the autism has given him a view on life that most of us don't have. What is it like being a parent to two autistic twins and also serve in the military? Um, you know, it's a little weird. Uh, you, you do kind of have to have, like everybody talks about the switch where you're at work or you're at home and you kind of have to be able to, to determine when you're a Marine or when you're a dad. But I think it's it's even more critical when you're raising kids that, you know, they, they, they thrive off of the emotional vibe of a place. You know, the kids may not be able to talk, but they can read you 100%. So if you're carrying some bullshit from work because, you know, your captain or your, your gunny or whatever made you do a task that was completely unnecessary and there's something, you know, you're carrying that kind of baggage inside, that's going to bleed over to your kids and that's going to make them a little bit more upset. Um, and that took us a long time to really read. Um, when I was younger and I had more, more negative coping mechanisms, I would literally get home, step by the trash cans, smoke a cigarette, and try to zen myself in like the most counterproductive way possible. And now, you know, after a lot of growth and a lot of, um, a lot of effort internally, it's to the point now where I'll, I'll, I'll listen to podcasts or I'll, I'll hang out in the car for a few minutes and just kind of mentally wash that stuff away. Cause that's an everyday thing. It doesn't matter if you're in the military or not. That's something that's gonna um, affect who you are and what you deal with, you know, as you come into the house and deal with the kids. So how, how long did it take you to learn that? A long time, longer than I think, longer than I think I needed. Um, just because, I mean, you get so stubborn. You know, you think, oh, I'm 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 important because I'm the breadwinner, or I'm important because I have this big job and I'm doing all this cool stuff, and that's nice, but that's your family, right? Like that's that's something that's more important and that's that's really the bigger thing in your life. So, um, learning that prioritization didn't really happen for me until come, kind of recently. And honestly, through a lot of therapy and stuff too. Does he gravitate towards you like this a lot? Yeah, um, especially when I'm in a position where he can do this kind of stuff because he wants me to pick him up and walk him around the house. Um, he's, he's kind of a koala bear on the inside sometimes. So this is him kind of initiating play that he likes to initiate, get that sensory satisfaction by rocking around and, and getting picked up and stuff. So he's, he's just being him. This is what we mean when we say, bird knows what he wants and he knows how to get it out of life. Mm. <laughs> oh, here we go. All right, what's up, buddy? Do you walk around with him, giving him a piggyback a lot? Oh yeah, I he, he loves it. Go ahead. Uh, he's he's a big fan of it. Sometimes because he's getting taller now, I gotta watch out on doorways and stuff because he'll climb up on me when I'm changing Emmett in the bathroom, and I gotta be really careful. They do like their own space. You, they don't really like somebody coming into their space trying to initiate contact with them if they're not ready for it. So. One of the big things with Emmett is when he does want the attention, he will get it. Um, he's, a, he's definitely a cuddle bear when he wants to be and he'll, he'll climb up into your lap and laugh and you know play with your face and stuff. Um, Dominic's a little bit more outgoing, kind of like you saw, and, and he's not so much cuddles as he is play. crazy sensory play where you can climb with him and, and, and show him how to do different stuff. It's beautiful but also hard at the same time. You know, 
you never think that you're, this is gonna be their future. When you have kids and you know, when I was pregnant, Dev and I had all these, you know, dreams, I guess, parents have for their kids and um, aspirations they have for their kids. And then when they were born, it was a little rocky because they were newborns. And then we got the diagnosis probably a year and a half after they were born, so like one and a half. And that's when you kind of realize your dreams and aspirations for your kids are gonna be different. Um, and for me, I feel like I took it a little bit better early on. And Devin took it better on the back end. I've always taken it very well in stride, but there's things that I do better with and there's things that he does better with. Um, you know, for the boys, it is hard to know that they'll struggle for the rest of their lives. That they're always going to need some supportive support aid or um, somebody there to help them. But at the same time, the way they see the world and the way they see people is so special and so uncommon that it gives it just a beauty to it. Every dad comes into the world and they're like, man, I can't wait to throw throw the ball. I can't wait to see my kid play middle linebacker. I can't wait for, you know, you, you have these almost imaginary expectations from for this new life that you brought into the world. And then when you get the diagnosis and things turn out a little different, it can feel very similar to actually losing that because you're losing all those expectations. So you're kind of grieving those 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 specific dreams when in reality, yeah, that was something that was there, but that might have been unfair to put on a kid anyway. So um, instead of focusing on all the different things that you are understandably excited for, focus on being excited for what you can do to learn and what you can do to bring you know, a very happy soul into the world because those kids love people unconditionally anyway. Is this kind of like the, the baseline here? The boys are exploring, checking out different things and moving constantly? Yeah, this is, this is home. Uh, Emmett is a constant pacer. He has to always be pacing. Um, if he's not pacing, he'll lay down and maybe watch a movie for 20 minutes and then he'll get up and pace. Dominic is also a pacer, but not as much. They like to roam. They have a lot of energy. During the week, we do school and therapy. So the weekends are their time to just relax and really be themselves. And that's why you don't do that. You're a Marine? I am. Have you learned any skills in the Marines which have helped you be successful as a parent? No, but I've learned a lot of skills as a parent that's helped me be a better Marine. Like what? Um, well, patience is a big one. Uh, they're, so I didn't yell very often as a young NCO anyway. But when, when the kids came around and we really had to learn how to communicate their language and stuff, I've learned how to communicate with my juniors so much better. And that's helped my team, the teams that I have been able to run, grow so much more effectively because I know how to kind of sit back, observe a kid, and then give him the proper coaching instead of the old core way of, you know, getting into getting into their business and knife hand, scream, yell, 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 things get fixed and then you go on to the next thing. Um, and sometimes the knife hand, scream, yell, yell, yell causes more problems, but that's oftentimes the only way you get taught to make an on-the-spot correction. So um, there's, there's definitely aspects that have helped me grow a lot as a Marine that I've adopted from being a dad. Can you tell me about how your living room is kind of set up to help the boys succeed? You have the trampoline there, you have buttons they can push that say things all over. Communication's hard for the kids, so we have buttons where you, we bought these on Amazon and you can literally print out whatever you want in your printer. They come, these, this part comes out and then you voice it so you could say milk please. Juice, juice please, please and that allows them to ask for what they want and then over here we have the help me button because they try to they like Dominic likes to take things off the wall to play with and then by the TV we have I want to watch TV and then I'm thirsty I'm frustrated play with me and then yes and no and we're currently working on um, emotions so I'm they're not here yet, but I made posters with each emotion and we'll have a button under each emotion. We're gonna put them here 
and that way we can try to help the boys learn what each emotion is. You briefly mentioned off camera how CPS was called? Yeah, yeah. Um, so what had happened was <laughs> Emmett was still going through his really bad SIB periods. So at night, sometimes he would have a meltdown and because we didn't have air conditioners for them, um, we had to have the windows open. Well, one Saturday night going into Sunday morning, Emmett had about 15 minutes worth of behavior. So I rushed in there, I put his helmet on, I gave him new milk, and over time he calmed down even though he was still awake. One of our neighbors heard the SIB incident and they made the logical assumption that one of us was hitting our kids. I don't necessarily think it's that logical and honestly if you're that concerned about it, you should go stop it yourself. But from my perspective, like that's just me being kind of holding a grudge against those people. But So he was hitting himself. Yeah, he was hitting himself and the, the parents made the assumption that we were hitting him. Would never happen. And um, they called PMO or on base military police. And PMO brought in Oceanside and CPS police to go respond to, to the house as well. And about 15 minutes after the incident ended, the cops knocked on the door and like I popped, I, I looked outside of our, our bedroom window and I saw a stack of cops like getting ready to bust, burst into the house and arrest us all and stuff. So I came downstairs, I cracked open the door, the cops are like, hey, we need to do a welfare check. I go, I got it, can I go put a shirt on? They're like, yeah, you just have to open the door. So I go upstairs, put on my shirt, grab my wallet and I go downstairs. And as I'm opening the door, one of the cops literally like shines a light, goes for his gun. I'm like, chill out, dude. Everything's fine. I got a special needs family. Come on inside. And we have the gates because these windows are really big and they're really easy to open. And my kids would just go right outside. <laughs> they would pop it right out and go right outside. So we have the gates. They keep it's everything in this house is for safety of the kids. We do everything to make sure they're safe because there's gonna be days where we're tired and I have to know that they're safe. What would happen if they got outside and you didn't know? So my kids are elopers, they will take off. When they were younger and they got the diagnosis, we had like a dining table, we had furniture. I thought, and I think Deb and I thought as a family, life is already stacked against them so much, they need a safe haven and why not have their home be their safe haven? So for us, it makes our lives easier having the trampling, having the bean bags, having outside furniture instead of inside furniture because it's a little bit more durable, but it also allows the boys to be themselves um, in a way that they don't have to conform in their own home. What were some of their earliest symptoms of autism? Um, so my wife really noticed it first and she also had uh, developmental assistance folks inside the house called Edis um, when we were in Okinawa and she was saying as early as like nine months that she was worried about them having autism because they would really fixate on the vents, they really were particular about like a few specific shows and they really had a hard time eating foods. And we didn't know it at the time but the foods thing was a separate sort of issue or an adjunct sort of issue but she was interpreting it as um, a lot of the internet pieces will talk about how autism kids really only like to eat chicken nuggets in a specific order or whatever. And she was picking up on that and potentially associating it with the autism as well. So yeah, that was really like, she, she, she picked it up and then I didn't necessarily believe it because they were so young and I didn't really believe it until the day that we got the diagnosis. So for the longest time, Emmett was not able to travel. Um, as soon as we got him in the cars that we had at the time, he would immediately go off, extreme self-injurious behavior. And in the cars we had at the time, it was very dangerous. He would kick the window or just, it was just very dangerous. So my husband and I finally were able to put money down and buy our bus with Emmett's needs and Dominic's needs. If we go somewhere, it also gives us you know, if we go to the zoo or we go to SeaWorld or we go to a doctor's appointment, it gives us the opportunity to take them back to the bus. You'll see in a minute, we have like a comm station in it and they can go through whatever they need to go through and then be able to go back. In the past, if we ever went anywhere and one of them went off, we would have to immediately leave. Um, 
And so the fact we kind of have a house on wheels is super important, but it also gives us the opportunity to show the boys the world, which we were not able to before. So this area is kind of where they'll go if we're parked somewhere. Can I jump in it? Yeah. And they'll have a mount down. If they have a mount down, they can have it here and they're safe, right? We put padding in, we had everything done. You'll bring them here to have their meltdown and mm -hmm. then bring them back out to yeah. wherever you are? Yeah, I feel like you never wanna be judged on your worst day, right? Who wants to be judged on your worst day? And unfortunately our kids, the littlest thing can set them off. So the fact that they have a place to come that they know and work out whatever's going on is huge. Emmett is having a blast with all of his sensory. <laughs> While Dominic takes a little nap. Yes. Dominic loves his bean bag. Dominic also loves fish. So we have the aquarium on probably, I would say, like 80% of the day. We have some sort of documentary with fish or underwater animals. What is this? Ah, so Dominic thinks that everything is a tablet. <laughs> so he thinks the TV is a tablet where you can touch it and play on it just like a regular tablet, but you can't do that on a TV and TVs are really expensive. So we bought sensory tiles and he plays with these. We redirect him to these instead of the TV. There's a lot more autism representation in movies, TV shows, documentaries than there was a decade ago. But do you feel like your family is represented in autism representation? You want me to answer? Um, I mean, we can both how do I say this? I don't agree with it. Some of the, the movies and TV shows that I've seen, I think it gives a false narrative to autism. Um, I haven't seen a lot of the documentaries, so I can't really talk on those. Can you talk about that false narrative though? So like, you know, the good doctor or some of these other things that are on Netflix that aren't necessarily um, documentaries. Autism is a spectrum, right? It's an umbrella spectrum. And every child you meet with autism is exactly that, that one child. They might all have similarities, but they're all individuals within themselves. And so when you meet one child with autism, that is their autism. Dominic and Emmett are twins, but they have two different types of autism. When I, I think, um, I think is a false narrative to parents that get the diagnosis early on that autism is not a death sentence. It's not, but I think that you should be educated within yourself and be prepared for what that can mean for you and your family. I think that there are definitely people with autism that are doctors and lawyers and have all these things. But on the lower side of autism, which we see in our household, there's not a lot of representation. And when we got the diagnosis for autism, I feel like things like that give a false narrative because you think, oh, well, if this is autism, this is how that person's going to be because maybe that's the only thing that, let's say your neighbor, right? Your neighbor doesn't know what autism is, but they've seen this TV show. So you say, oh, my son's autistic. And they're like, oh, like, like this TV show. Um, so that's what your child's like. And I just feel like it kind of gives, like I said, a false view of really how things are. My last question for you, is there anything left unsaid that you would like to express? While you're there, be present. You know, just be there for the kids. And even if you got to take time to step away or you got to, you know, listen to podcasts while you're doing stuff with the kids or whatever it is to, to keep things like emotionally stable if things are hard, um, be there anyway. Because the, the more time and, and, and effort that you invest into the kids, the longer and the more strong your bond's going to be. And it's just going to be so much more worth it as you watch them grow instead of feeling kind of alienated or dissociated because you're just a dude that's in the family and then you're just kind of there to, to make sure they have insurance. Like that's not the way to look at it. So um, it's, it's, it's big for, for that aspect is to be there as an active member of the family.